everyone and welcome to this EN Engage session. I am delighted, I'm always delighted actually, but I'm doubly delighted this time to welcome Ed Tranter. Ed is Managing Director of 73 Media, a company that he launched himself and prior to that has a fairly meaty corporate career with a number of the, the interesting and big players in our sector. So Ed, welcome. Hi, thank you very much for having me on. You're very welcome. It's a joy and a pleasure to have you here. So um, a couple of things that I wanted to talk to you about, Ed. Firstly, I'm really interested to hear about the growth of 73 Media. And certainly over the last year, the route that you've been taking has had to change either through necessity, but also through opportunity. Yeah. And that will be a natural and rather lovely segue onto talking about how you've been able to make online and digital in the event space work really, really well for you and your clients at 73. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, tell us about how brilliant your company is. Tell us about what's been happening. <laughs> in the last Hang on a second, let me get the brochure and I'll start reading. Yes. Um, so <laughs> uh, I feel slightly uncomfortable with the question, tell us how brilliant your company is. Um, I get So to take it back, as you said at the beginning, as to the potted history, um, I set the company up to be an organiser. So it was a physical event organiser. Um, digital virtual events was not on my radar, nor had I ever intended that it would be. Um, my background is physical events, um, and that's what I wanted to do. So I launched uh, the rugby show and then the One Earth show, both as B2C events one at the rico and one at the nec um <clears throat> and all was going tremendously well uh, right up until the point that we had a global pandemic stopping all physical events happening everywhere um so our, our our business was built on three component parts really so the the business entities were 73 originals we called it so that is the, the events that we owned and ran. Um, I had two other launch ideas, which were supposed to have launched by now, but we've just sat on them until things change. Then we had, I always launched it on the basis of, since I was funding the startup of the business myself, I, I wanted to have a steady business model as well as the launch elements, which are obviously traditionally very cost intensive. And though the return is higher, it takes time and so on. So, so um, I set up this with 73 Originals. Then the second part of the business was managed by 73. So we'd always had an agency-led side of the business, which was focused on um, kind of delivering strategy through to being the complete events team, running the whole event from start to completion, or creating your launch idea and developing it, or taking on someone's event and helping to improve it. So and was the plan oh, there that that would be physical events? All physical, 100% okay. physical. There was no, no plan at any point. Looking back on it, every document I have from starting the business, you know, waiting for when it goes into the museum, um, <laughs> is um, there is not a single element at any point that says virtual or digital events anywhere, because it was never within my thinking. <laughs> And then the other aspect of it was doing kind of more corporate events, largely based around sport, which was called front row seat. And these were kind of corporate experiences, you know, dinners, um, client dinners in the dressing room at Twickenham when you have some England players there or corporate shooting days where you've got famous rugby player captaining one team, cricketer captaining another, so on and so forth. So that was more to do with, I understand how events work and I like sport. So it was kind of a nice segue, but all of those have obviously stopped. You and I can talk for hours about rugby, can't we? We can, we can, especially now that you've uh, fully appreciated that the hockey stick is not an integral part of a rugby match. I have no, I have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, you know, if it hasn't got a stick, there's no point playing. Just, a, just really interesting thing you said there. Every document that you made talks about physical. So when you're thinking about now, and we're I'm just jumping ahead a little bit, we'll have to go back in a moment. When you're thinking about now, about when you're you're creating a, a, a digital plan, how different? Is that that plan from your physical one? Oh, can you cut and paste, or do you have to simply tear it up and start again? So I think one of the one of the big challenges everybody obviously had to leap into um, either to weather the storm. If you're a company that was big enough, you could weather the storm, mothball elements of your business, keep the communi communication going, furlough a number of your staff, and as soon as the opportunity came to release everything back into the market, that's what you would do. 
And so for bigger players, that is a large proportion of what people have done. For others, it was, we're going to go digital or virtual, whichever word you want to use. And at the start, people started then lifting their physical event and dropping it into online. And that simply doesn't work. Physical events by by definition, if they work right, it is because you've built everything around human engagement where you are together physically at the time. And virtual doesn't work that way. So the process of a plan is the same. You have your KPIs, you know what, in our case, what your client wants, or indeed what we want when we've done it ourselves, and what good looks like. And how you're going to engage audiences. So if you're, if good looks like we want people to actually make transactional business deals, or we want people to have one-to-one meetings, or we want people to have a sense of community, or we want them to learn, whatever your KPIs are, you build it around the platform that you're going into. And the platforms for me, and I've said this on numerous occasions, so apologies for repeating myself, but the platforms are your venues. <laughs> So, you know, some people leap in and get a great deal with a platform. And so then they buy it for five events and then they work out what the events are afterwards. We would never go to out to as a physical organizer, we would never go out and say, oh, they've got a great date and a great um, price at that venue over there. Now I'm going to work out what event I'm going to put in it. You just would never do that. And so virtual is no different as an experience and as a space. But the delivery mechanism and the nature of how people engage with it is completely different. So you have to marry up. So to a certain extent, because every platform is different and the difference between physical and virtual is that your pla- your venues online always have availability. <laughs> so you're not forced into, well, I've only got two dates that I can go with, so I'm going to have to go with this venue. They all have availability 24-7, 365 days a year. So therefore depending on what platform you use, the nature of how your event works will be fundamentally different for every single time. So so there is a degree of, you start from scratch with certain key principles, but fundamentally the event plan is different every time you do it. So where in in the, in, what, in what time period last year did you wake up and go, well, hang, this isn't going to work, this physical thing. I need to start looking at digital solutions. Where did that happen in that evolution? Um, so it was a combination of things. I was, uh, I think I was watching the news on one screen on my desk and on the other screen I was looking at my bank balance. Uh, <laughs> and and I was just like, well... I was telling you something. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know... Um, I think it was, there's a, it's like anything. There is a degree of, as you alluded to before, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, and so initially, when it all first started, I mean, I was at Confex. We were at Confex as, as the whole industry was. And then suddenly, oh, they're not coming because of COVID and this has happened. And then people I met would say, oh, I've started getting symptoms. And you get a text message coming through. And at the time, the news was playing and and everyone was talking about it as though it seemed like you know a nasty kind of flu and we're just like well this seems a bit over the top surely it can't be as bad as all that and now look at where we are um as the information came through and 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 opinions changed so so for us it was like well okay looks like there's going to be some kind of delay in us being able to do things but what's that going to be what two three months maybe tops and then very very quickly it became abundantly clear no it isn't And I was, as a business, we were not in a position where I could sit there and go, well, it's okay then. If if nothing happens for the next six months, we'll just sit there and it'll all be fine. We had to find a new route, even if it was a short-term route, to build the business and and sustain us um, because we're a small company. You know, we are, we are, are not able to do a billion pound share offering if we lose 800 million in the first six months. So apparently others can. So that's fine, but that's not how we work. So, so come sort of end of March, early April, clearly the rugby show wasn't going to happen in June. And so, and I just didn't know enough. And I sat with the team and I said, I don't, we don't know enough about virtual. I want to learn about virtual. So, um, learn everything that was possible for us to learn. We took on, checked out platforms, learned how everything integrated, looked at what good looked like and everything else. And then I said, right, in five weeks time, we're going to run the virtual rugby show. 
um, and we're going to go hell for leather at this and we're going to do everything as big as it can possibly be. So we're not going to start off small and give it a whirl. We're going death or glory in the same in the first instance. And so we ran a three day event with multiple stages, 63 speakers, 95 percent live to camera um, and 3000 attendees. And we just went for it. And it, I can honestly say it nearly killed us, but it delivered a phenomenally successful event at the end of it. And we were very fortunate to, for it's been shortlisted for the EN Awards uh, virtual event of the year, which we're very pleased about. But what it meant was that we learned a huge amount, gave us confidence and, and, um, and a proven track record of delivering something huge with really big name, famous people. And from there, we then hit the virtual agency side of the business because that was the quickest way around. People knew that they didn't know how to do these things. We had learned an enormous amount. And in, since you know, nearly a year of doing this now, um, as I've said to you before, it's like dog years doing virtual events. If you've got a year's experience, it's like you've got seven years experience in normal events because there's been so much transition and change and we've run things across multiple platforms for people in different countries and different... <laughs> We've run um, events for charities. We've run events for associations, for corporates, for other um, organizers um, and everything in between. And sports franchises, as you as you already know, um, we were very fortunate to have close links with WASPs. And so spoke to them about how they obviously couldn't deliver their physical events which is what their sponsorship is based on and contractually is deliverables. And we were able to provide them with a virtual engagement platform that meant they could deliver those things and keep sponsors happy and not have to refund monies and so on. And as a result of the first one being so successful, they appointed us the official virtual events partner, which is the first time in premiership rugby history that a club has taken one of those on. And so it kind of everything knocked on from everything else, but it's about, it's like anything in the events industry. It's about adaptability, seeing an opportunity, being creative, and then working your nuts off. Um, one of the great things about 73 Media, and we talked about it being a brilliant company. It is a brilliant company. It's because it's so agile. And as you just said now, you've, you've tried so many different things. A lot of people are really still struggling. We, we get the you know, it's great as a brand builder, it's great as a, as a community engagement, it's great as a lead gen, but actually they're not always great. Digital events are not always great or virtual events, not always great as a, as a profit contributor. Because of all the experience you've had, you'll have seen things work and not work. And, and advising people who are listening in today, what route do you want to take? If you're looking to make some money out of this, what's your recommendation, Ed? Where, where have you found from experience things work and things don't? So I think actually most events that we've worked on have made a profit. In fact, I think with the exception of ones where it literally was charitable communi uh, communication and community engagement, where it was more about raising awareness, which tends to be more of the charity type stuff, everything else has made money for everyone that's done it. And, and then, that, it's about quantity, isn't it? Profit. Is, that a, is that a gross or net level? Net, net profit, a net net. <laughs> so, um, but I think it depends on, it goes back to what are you trying to achieve? So, and also levels of profit. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and say that virtual and digital events are the replacement because they, you know, there was a bit of concern and people talking about, well, it will never replace physical events or, or will it replace physical events? And there's been two schools of thought and a bit like becoming a vegan, very strong opinions in both sides. <laughs> and it's, and they want to tell everybody. it. Um, for me, now we've opened Pandora's box with virtual digital events. What that means is everybody, consumers, business users, everybody is now using, used to using this technology. Literally everyone, you know, my children talk to their grandparents on it all the time. My son um, is playing chess with his granddad every week and they do it all over on screen. Everybody knows how to do it now. And that's not going to get switched off. It's been a huge benefit actually of the pandemic has been this ability to communicate remotely and using different technologies. What I don't think it will do is replace physical contact. We are designed, I think, at our, at our cellular level 
to be in relationship with people. That is what we are built for. We all know how desperate we are to meet up again as soon as we possibly can. And it's and it's a fire within everyone. It's just there. And that cannot be replicated by these virtual events. So for me, there will always be the scale will be physical events. As Peter James would say, serendipity in a, in a virtual platform, you cannot create something where someone's walking to a conference session, sees something out the corner of the eye on the stand, walks onto it, and then suddenly they're your biggest customer. You know, you cannot do that in a virtual platform because you don't need to walk anywhere. You go to your content session and you can see all the other things on the left-hand bar or the drop-down menu, and you don't access any of them. So that will always remain as it is. But I do believe that going forward, digital virtual events, whatever you want to call them, will be a channel that will remain and will grow because they offered things that are different to what the physical events have. And, and the true, I think the people that truly succeed will be the ones that marry up the strengths of all of them and apply them in the right measure to build their business. So in terms of profitability, at the moment, the scale of profitability generally across events, there'll be exceptions in every situation, will be that profit will be much, much higher on physical events than it is on virtual ones. That being said, I've worked on events in the last 12 months where the client has generated six-figure profits comfortably, um, which are well worth doing, and they haven't had the cost of the venue, and they haven't had all the other things that go with it, and they've been flexible. But part and parcel of that success comes back to what I said right at the start. Do not try and replicate how you made your money from your physical one into your virtual one. And that's true of an awards, or it might be true of an exhibition. As yet, I have not seen personally really strong exhibition hall style stands where people come and visit and really engage. I think one-to-one -one meetings and enabling people that are your, your, your buyers that are coming to engage with all the content, creating formats where they can have instructive and useful one-to-one -one meetings with suppliers, that has real value. It has real value for the supplier and it has real value for the end user. Having a stand with a load of stuff listed on it, like a glorified directory, however pretty, for me, doesn't tie up the strengths of digital. And I think that comes back to that whole element of, I think we move almost into becoming broadcast TV production with virtual digital events, which is very different to physical um, and it's taking advantage of what you're creating at the time and seeing it as the longevity of what you can create and monetize, not just during the show, but afterwards, is significant. I'd love to hear a bit more about that, because one of the, for me, um, you and I have known each other for some time, and I think one of the, the real skill sets that you have is this lack of fear about pushing boundaries and where we've seen so many other folk in the event world. As you, And again, I think you and I, I think you were the first person that identified this early last year by saying one of the big problems we have is that we put the word event in the word and the word digital together. And actually, if we think about just digital, then that means we're so much more open to the things that we can do as organisers. So yeah. you've pushed those boundaries really hard. You've, you've almost bypassed some of the more traditional routes to a digital event. And I think this, this production stroke TV stroke whatever, I think it's a really interesting concept. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that works in a, for, for traditional event organisers? So I think it's, it, as I say, it comes back to you take your event format, what it is, what does good look like, and then seeing the opportunity that you can expand beyond that. So if you take an awards as an example, if you're going to take a um, an awards digital, then actually it can be very easily turned into something that is mind-numbingly dull. Because when you think about the physical event, the mainstay of it, if we go to the EN Awards, which obviously we were, we all want to do, then the whole industry's there. There's a real sense of celebration. Yes, we're all kind of like cheering and clapping and wanting to win, but fundamentally it's about gathering together, seeing everyone that you love in the sector and just celebrating everything to do with it. And you cannot recreate that digitally because otherwise what you're left with is a sea of categories and shortlists all being read out normally by Alan Dedicote and then <laughs> at the end of it all of us going yay because we're all sat on our own 
So, so therefore, that's still the fundamental of your event. You have to produce it that way because that's what the meat is that people are coming for. But how do you create that engagement and excitement around the edges? And so it's looking at it differently. Don't just think, well, actually, the awards is from six till eight or it's from seven till nine, and then we'll just shut it off. Don't think of it like that. We we had a client that we work with um, who have they just announced it today, actually, has been shortlisted for the uh, Digital Awards of the Year in the Digital Events Awards category. That's a lot of the same words, all in the same sentence. But, um, but that's been shortlisted, which we are obviously delighted about. But... One of the creative things there was was engagement, that conversation, that communication. So the platform that we used for the awards was open three days prior to the actual awards taking place. So we got everyone to register because you have to register for the software and the platform, GDPR and so on. You can't register them yourselves. So they came in and we engaged with content within the platform to say, use this as an opportunity to talk, to network. And 400, you know, close to 400 people actually were having meetings and one-to-ones in the three days up until the awards event began. Because we had the platform anyway, you don't have to pay three, three days extra tenancy use the platform that you've got and try and think of something different to create engagement and conversation, those networking aspects you would normally have. And then when the awards happened, yes, we had 26 categories or whatever it was. And yes, it was six, seven, eight companies per shortlist and you had to sit through it, but make it live and engage. Put in what I call, and I'm thinking of getting this trademarked, palette cleanser content that allows you to segment sections of the content with a different medium for delivery of information. So it might be something really fun. It might be a surprise. It might be entertainment. One of the things I'm desperate to do, and I want to do another event at some point, is during the awards is I want to have a live band doing the segment, doing the walk-ups and all this sort of stuff so that you can have a house band that does the break-in between sections of awards. (laughs) So it's just doing different things, seeing what you can do. And you can basically do anything. But then coming back to this video content bit, when we were recording it all, obviously we wanted the judge's piece. So we get why the judge felt they won. So that was a piece of recording we needed to do. We had the sponsor's piece where they say, we're delighted to sponsor this category and the winner is. And so we knew we were going to get them for that. We had senior people within the organization and within the industry who are being recorded for two minute sound bites of bits. And so you could, and lots of people do, just record that, done, dusted, production's finished, and off we go. So what we said was, okay, everyone's going to want to know why they won. The sponsors have chosen that category for a reason because that's the people they're trying to target. And the judge, I'm sure, could say far more than the 60 seconds we restrict them to, or 30 seconds in some cases. So we've got them all anyway. We have true HD, you know, production values. We can put all stings on the front. We can bring their names up. We can do all this beautiful stuff. Let's get them to stay on longer. Do the bits that we need for the actual physical awards and then get them all to stay on longer to talk in a 20, 30-minute program all about what their event is, you know, what um, to talk all about why this is a really important topic area and turn it into TV content that then in turn, the organization can get the sponsors to shell out a lot more for. And then you produce it and you send it out after the awards to every single person that attended and then to your wider database. And then it sits there. The supplier can then have it for their information to go to their customers. And all you've done is extended by about half an hour all the work you're doing anyway. It's all free. It doesn't cost you anything to do it. And then you've turned really valuable content and you've kept the conversation going for the event going forward. And that is a new way of commercializing your standard awards or your events, because normally when we've done TV, certainly in my experience, it might be everyone else is doing it far better than me, but in my experience of doing it for awards, B2B events, conferences, the only video we ever did was a few Vox Pops, pieces to camera from sponsors saying about why they were so delighted to be at the event and turning it into a two to three minute video that we would use to try and get more people to exhibit or turn up. We didn't ever say, well, this content's great for that because we weren't structured or built in order to do it. In this platform, you're bringing them into either a back-end software, vMix or whatever, or into the platform, and it's very easy to turn it into 
uh, production values and high quality content that can be commercialized. It is, it's really, it's the ultimate repackaging of content, isn't it? Yeah, we've been talking about that for mm, quite a long time, I guess. But it, it's uh, you're able to do it in a way with digital that you've never been able to do with the other mediums we possess. So what's really interesting is that your your business has, has just adopted this and run with it. Do you think you would have adopted at anywhere near the same speed or even adopted at all if we hadn't have had a bat pangolin moment? No. Um, I think, well, certainly not at the speed. I like to think that I'm fluid enough in my thinking to that if an opportunity had come up, I would have looked at it. But we had a plan, you know. We had a strategy. This is what we were going to do. These were the events I wanted to do. We had some other events we were doing for other clients. And that was the business. You know, we were in we were in great shape for, a, you know, this is, we've just finished our second year of trading. <laughs> So to to launch, get through the first year and be going, great, here we go. <laughs> and our first year with all our big events was uh, was 2020, was was to say the least a bit of a challenge. But, you know, and then there was a brief period of moment where I was curled up in the fetal position under my desk, sucking my thumb. But, <laughs> but then you take a breath and you get up and you either sit there and wait or you try and change things. And so I like to think I would have gone for it as soon as the opportunity arose but certainly no of course not you know i wasn't this wasn't on my radar at all and it, it's not good thing is it hasn't stunted your growth so so that's that's great certainly not around the middle i mean i've had a, i've had 12 months of netflix and biscuits i'm yeah great combo <laughs> it's a great combo just as well i don't wear a suit because none of them fit now we can just wear from the top upwards it's fine um does you, when you think about once this is all over and we're getting some stability and some traction and, and what have you, do you think you'll go back? Does your heart yearn to be back in that physical space? Do you feel that you're fully uh, digital now or do you think there's going to be a halfway house? Where do you, where do you think that 73 and, and Ed are going to land? Um, I cannot wait to get back to physical events cannot wait i mean there's nothing quite like it i to be fair i i guess as a, a as an early adopter or whatever you want to call me but i've embraced the the virtual digital side just because i have and i've seen really big strengths to the way that these things can be delivered and the benefits and the and the opportunity so 100 percent, we won't be shutting that off at all but you know, I, I love my steel toe cap boots and my high vis. I want to get back on a show floor and watch it being built. I want to do what we're supposed to be doing. And and as I say, at the moment, I am working on um, launches that I am anticipating doing um, in the physical space. But this has been, I tell you what's been really interesting actually is that by doing, by by looking and learning something new, it naturally challenges what you traditionally do and i think that's a really healthy thing so for us um looking at virtual and understanding what good looks like there has challenged me in my my understanding of what good looks like in the physical event arena and and you know i've always prided myself on doing pretty decent events in the physical side of things as well and you know being fortunate enough to to win some awards for them but everything can be improved you always need to be learning and actually it's quite an energizing thing learning new stuff and engaging new stuff and trying new things it's a bit like that um, doing that university lecture the other week that i did never done anything like that before my mother was terribly proud because i never really made it to university so so um but it challenged but talking to all these end um final year students at the university of east london um and their questions made me think about things that I hadn't thought about in years because I'm not a final year student about to start a career. I'm on the other, you know, 20 plus years in. So it's all those things kind of refresh your thinking. And I think it's just really good to do that. So um, we'll, we'll be doing both going forward, no question. I think the opportunity for learning has been overwhelming. My, my personal motto is move fast, break things, learn, repeat. And it, it's, you know, we, we've we've had that in, in bucketfuls over the last 12 months. So Yeah, 100%. Um, 
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ed Tranter. Really, really great to chat to you and really, really interesting to hear about what you've been doing and look forward to seeing how that evolve, evolves over the, the coming years. So thank you.